Hi, I'm Patricia Greenberg. Today, my guest is Dr. Alan Resnick, and he's a board-certified orthopedic surgeon specializing in arthroscopic surgery and sports medicine. He's the author of the newly released The Knee and Shoulder Handbook, The Keys to a Pain-Free, Active Life. Welcome, Dr. Resnick. Thanks for having me, Patricia. This is a great now, more than 100 million Americans struggle with chronic pain, and according to one Institute of Medi Medicine estimate, at an annual cost of as much as $635 billion in treatment and lost product productivity. Now, these institutes and these research studies and these people that talk about the impact, it's always a monetary impact. Have you noticed that? <laughs> there, there's yeah. always... This is what it costs us uh, in, in injury and, and lost productivity and people not working. Um, but I want to talk about the personal impact that it has on people. Why are so many people walking around in chronic pain? I know that's a big question. That, but, that is a big question. Yeah. You know, I, I think that the best part of what you said is the personal impact, because I'm in the office every day with patients. And if you sit and listen to them, it, it, number one, it's never, I always joke with people, it's never the best time to break your leg. Right. <laughs> and it's never a good time to miss work. And it's never a good time to miss a plane flight or a vacation or a party or whatever. Um, but if you listen to patients, I think that overwhelmingly, the reason they're there is because of the personal impact. So the dollars and cents initially doesn't make sense. Although for some patients, it does become an issue if you can't return to work. Right. So, you know, overall, the dollars and cents are meaningful in the bigger picture, because it does it is a way of measuring the net effect of society, but everyone takes it personally. Um, and, um, you know, trying to help people navigate the physical part of that also includes a mental part of that, that you have to kind of nurse people through the idea that they can get better, they may get better slower than they might want. But, you know, to follow the directions and, and, and participate in their care is really important. And I think that's, that's some of the things I like to touch on often with patients is that, as I, as I like to say that if you're, it's, um, it's an old saying, but you know, your best educated patient who understands their disease process the best, is usually my best partner in getting them better. So, so I think all those things tie together in that way. Now, is it true that as you age, aches and pains are normal? Uh, it seems that so many professionals and laymen both are blaming it on age. I think this kind of circles back to well, I'm 50, my knees are going to start to go on me or my, I mean, is is it inevitable? Yeah. I mean, let, let me just roll back to when you're a child, right? Your child, okay. you're actively growing. Mm -hmm. So you're constantly replenishing your bone, cartilage, ligaments, and tendons, because, you know, a, a baby's bone is maybe this big, you know, and then, you know, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. If you imagine a bone growing and it only grew one way, you know, every direction, all your bones would be round at some point, right? Right. right? So that makes no sense, right? It can't be that way. Your body has to constantly reshape and remold it as they get larger to match the shape that best aligns with the function of the joints and the muscles. And that's really what your body does. It's bone is amazing. Bone sees the forces, responds to the forces, and then reshapes itself. Understanding that process, when you're a child, the bone can turn over completely in three to six months, all new bone. As you get a little older, on average, every three to five years, as you get a little older, maybe it's five years, maybe it's 10 years. Every day you have stress in your bone, you actually sometimes injure it microscopically. So if I always tell people, if, if you have a fork and you bend it, you bend it a thousand times, it starts to crack. Well, the magic thing about bone is you go to sleep and it starts to repair itself. If your bone is turning over every three to six months and you have all new bone, your body doesn't care that much that you cracked it one time too many or 10 times too many. Very rapidly, it repairs those things and they disappear forever. But as you get older, your ability to repair at night and catch up with your own activities gets less and less. And Mother Nature's only way to tell you that you're ahead of yourself is by giving you some pain. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, you know, I, I did too much today. My muscles are really sore. Maybe I'll skip tomorrow. Well, yeah, you might need a recovery day and your body's telling you that. So I think that the perception that pain is more often and more frequent in adults has a lot to do with the fact that our reparative mechanisms slow down a bit. And then the other, the other thing is that, you know, things kind of accumulate. I, I hurt my knee in high school. It's always been my bad knee. You know, rainy day, I feel it. You can hear that stuff. Well, that one doesn't go away. Then you hurt your elbow. <laughs> that one becomes the thing. And by the time you're, you're seven years old, you've accumulated a lot of those. And sometimes you have a lot of aches and pains. So 
it, it seems like a natural progression between the rate of repair and the accumulation of injuries that, that some people have aches and pains more when they're older than they're younger. Now, you specifically in this book hone in on shoulders and knees, and I know everything's connected. We'll talk about that a little bit later in because I want, you know, I want to, um, you know, we're all going through it. There's a little something for me. It's the hip. My knees are in great shape. It's my hip now. You know, I think people don't put two and two together that a back pain may be the result of something going on with your knee or right. uh, shoulder pain could be something out of alignment in the entire body. So like, can we cover some of the ailments that people are suffering from? Like uh, the typical, you know, people come in and their knee hurts, their their shoulder hurts, uh, uh, bursitis, tendonitis, joint swelling that won't go away. What's the first step when somebody comes into you and says, my knee's been bothering me now for a couple of weeks and I didn't do anything. I didn't fall. I didn't hit it. What What are you looking for? So, so like, you know, is, is what I, I actually have the good fortune of teaching medical students and residents oh, okay. in my career. And I do, I've been doing that for a very long time. And it's always interesting to take someone who really doesn't understand how to take a careful history and get them to understand what it is to get the elements of that history together and then use that as a stepping stone to start to project forward what other questions you might ask a patient and then where would you go with potential diagnosis and then how do you rule those out, right? So that's the thing that happens every day for me automatically. Um, and you sometimes take granted that it takes a long time to amass that knowledge and put things together. So. For example, someone has knee pain, uh, the femur is one bone. So you have the hip and the knee are connected together. It's one okay. bone. So sometimes people have a very strong mapping of their hip to their knee. They have knee pain. It's really their hip and vice versa. Sometimes it's something in the lower back. And, and you have to piece together the, the history first. Like, okay, what is the character of the pain? Where did it start? How did it start? How often it's happening? Is it associating with swelling? So you touch upon what other things do we think about? Let's say someone has a painless swollen knee. Well, a painless swollen knee sometimes means Lyme disease. Mm. So you say, okay, did you ever get exposure to ticks? Are you in the woods? Do you think you had a rash? Uh, oh yeah, I had this little red rash two weeks ago. Okay, well, this could be Lyme, all right? Um, you know, is someone else could have gout, you know, another common problem. And other people have inflammatory diseases that um, are either genetic or are related to other illnesses like rheumatoid arthritis and the various type of other arthritis that people have. And there's a whole host of them. Lyme is only one of them, but there are so many of them. Um, I think, and I think we might've talked about this a little bit before, but because, um, you know, people talk about whether they should take gluten or not and, and eat gluten right. in their diet right. and get rid right. of. So right. that was something that I know we, we, um, we had touched upon previously, but just for the audience, there is some connection there in the sense that gluten itself sometimes is hard to digest and fragments of gluten stay in your gut. And as you know, sometimes the body then decides it doesn't like that as an immune response and people have various disorders and some people have celiac disease, which is well known. But there is a feeling that there is, even with other, even Crohn's disease, other GI problems, that there's an associated arthropathy, which is, you know, an inflammatory arthritis, which is also autoimmune in nature. Mm -hmm. And so some people feel that the gluten is a trigger for that. And if that's a trigger, then getting rid of gluten in your diet helps. But again, these circles of things that are connected um, are hard to understand for any individual. But once you have them, you can understand the little mechanism that explains it for you. But again, it's a little bit of detective work when someone comes in, like, you know, what is the real story? Of course, if someone says I was playing basketball, my knee went popped, I went down, it swelled immediately. Oh, they might have a fracture. It swelled in four hours. Well, maybe they have an ACL tear. Uh, it swelled two days later. Well, maybe they have a little meniscal tear or a lining that got pulled or a sprain. And, you know, now they're still overdoing it. So again, the pieces of the history pull everything together for me. And, and um, that's the kind of stuff that helps us figure out what's wrong without taking an x-ray or an MRI. I already have some ideas in my head. You know, this is the catch-22 that I think we all experience. We maybe experience an injury and hurt ourselves. And what do people do? They put a bag of ice on it and they say, well, if it doesn't feel better in five days, I'll go to the doctor. So, what, you know, how do we know? Um, I don't think we discussed this in the pre-interview too much because I know there's so much to talk about, but how do we know when it's the right time to go get medical help? Yeah, and this is uh, this right. Is that's a, I know it's another big question, question right? Yeah, because <laughs> I see some people who come in and they 
Oh, I, I it happened a week ago. It got better last week, but I had the appointment. So I thought I'd come in again anyway. And, you know, okay. Yeah. Maybe you really didn't need to see me, but maybe you had something else you wanted to talk about. Right. Um, so, I mean, there's some simple rules of thumb, like, you know, people say no pain, no gain and all that. And I always say to patients, a simple rule of thumb for that one is if a muscle is sore after you you've exercised or played sports and the next day it starts to feel a little better and the day after that feels a little better. Okay. That's not a problem. Okay. Uh -huh. That's all good. But if, if a joint is hurting and you find you have limitation of range of motion or it's swollen and you try to play through that, that's probably not a good idea. You know, the impetus for the body to make fluid is really, you know, what can, what can your joint do if it's mad? And I always say it can be hurtful or it could swell. If it's hurtful and swelling, okay, got two things wrong with now. Now you can't move it. You can't bend it. It looks deformed. I and mean, you start adding those things together. You got to see someone, right? So um, yeah. Yeah, um, when it comes to diagnosing, uh, I know that there's so many, there's the physical exam, there's the actual feeling the area. And I guess with your experience, you can safely and confidently make some educated guesses about what's going on. Like, why is it so difficult to get an X-ray or an MRI? And are those tests dangerous to have or harmful to have on a regular basis? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, right. Uh, Everybody calls you and says, do an MRI on my yeah, toe. Do an MRI that is a fantastic yeah. question. Uh -huh. you know, I, I think, you know, we live in a society where everyone thinks they know what the right answer is. And people have been trained to think that diagnostic tests tell all. Okay. And, and um Number one, it's expensive. And number two, it's just not necessary. We do, we overdo testing extensively. And it's a balance between the doctor's opinion and skills and the pressure from society to not miss certain things that we end up over testing. You know, the, the, for me every day, it's like, well, if you don't get an MRI, I'm going to sue you, you know, that kind of craziness. I mean, it makes no sense at all because the reality is 34 years of experience, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been doing this for a very long time. Yes, I'm not 100% right, but MRI isn't either. And the person reading the MRI is not 100% right. And there are certain known artifacts of those studies that actually throw things off. For example, if you have metal in a joint, you can't get a good MRI. Okay. Um, if the injury is very new and there's a lot of swelling and bruising, well, water is what MRI picks up the best. And if you understand the mechanics of it, it's about the proton spinning. It's all kinds of great stuff. It's very interesting science. I love to talk about that. Um, but if, for the issue of shorten it up a bit, if, the, if it's about where the water is and I have something bruised, it's going to light up very brightly on MRI. And sometimes things that light, light brightly on MRI today, two weeks from now will be normal. I see. And other times that's not true. So if you rush to get an MRI in certain settings for certain injuries, three weeks later, the MRI might be pretty normal or, or much more normal than it was. And sometimes a very early MRI isn't that helpful. Um, you know, if you, if you say, okay, what was the injury mechanism? Maybe I'll get an x-ray first. That's a very simple, straightforward test. Certainly in my experience, we do rare earth films now. It's all digital. The exposure is a hundredth of what it used to be for even the extremities. And extremity exposure is very low risk of causing any specific problems. So a plain x-ray for most people, it's a low cost, very safe modality. There's even papers have been written that if you're pregnant and you, and you have a broken ankle, it's far better for you to have a good diagnosis of your broken ankle to get it treated appropriately when you're pregnant than the x-ray is dangerous to the fetus. Mm -hmm. you know, the teams are collimated. They go to a small area and there's really almost no risk at all to anyone. And certainly after the first trimester, there's no risk to the fetus. And, and people worry about those things, but it actually turns out that it's really better to have a better diagnosis and get treated appropriately when you're pregnant than when you're not pregnant, right? It's even more important to get, get appropriate treatment. But I'm um, going back to the testing. So, so I think the thing is, is that I would say 90% of the time without an MRI, I pretty much know what's wrong. And for me, lots of times the MRI is like, okay, I think you have a problem that is likely to be surgical and you probably need this fixed. And an MRI will pin down the diagnosis, number one, you know, either agree or disagree with me. Number two, add information that I don't really have in nuances. So MRI is so powerful and so sensitive. I have a rotator cuff tear. Oh, you also have a labral tear and your biceps is swollen. Yes, your shoulder hurts for four reasons or three reasons. And MRI will help add those. I may have them on my shopping list and I want to fine tune that mm -hmm. because it helps in surgical planning. But remember, we did surgery before there was MRIs. Right. Patients, right? 
And, and so much of surgery is you open it up. And when I'm looking arthroscopically, I'm going to say open it up because I do most of my stuff fiber optically with the fi very micro surgery. When I look in with the fiber optic telescope, okay, it's a 4K picture. It's full color. I can move things around. I can turn the joint. I can watch it move. I can touch things with a probe. And, and you can see the blood flow. You, know, you can actually see blood vessels and you can see the capillaries and you can actually see with the definition scope I use, you can actually see the little blood vessels moving in the capillaries. That's how fine the definition can be if you tune it just right. That's fascinating. So, so you so really, that, it's like having um, a magnifying glass on the area that opens it up and, and brings it right without having to dig and probe. It's 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 right oh, there. It's, in front it's of incredible. You. And I can work on an area this big and and the television is the size of a, of a let's say a 24 inch screen mm -hmm. magnification 125 times. So the definition of that is so much better than MRI. We find out when MRI is wrong. Mm -hmm. And MRI is a mathematical thing. You know, people don't even understand this. This is kind of so interesting is that because we're looking at the spinning of the protons in the water and how much they move, we are generating an image that's digitally created based on where the computer thinks the water is moving. Mm -hmm. So now if water is moving in a blood vessel, that throws it off. If the patient moves in the scanner, that throws it off. Even if you move a quarter of an inch, you're going to throw off the scan. Um, and then it's all mathematical approximation. So MRI shows a picture when you look at the screen, but it's actually an imaginary picture. It's what the, we imagine the picture should look like, understand the digital information that's coming out of the person. Whereas X-ray is an actual shadow, right? And CAT scans in between. It's a digital representation of a billion shadows we make with a single beam that's going around you. So MRI is prone to some artifact based on the magnet and movement and, and the way water behaves and sometimes the sequence of injury. And so it can overread things many times. Um, and it can also miss certain things inherently. And sometimes we know which things it actually misses. So we might ask for an MRI arthrogram. We put a little water inside the joint so we see it better for shoulder, for labral tears, particularly a regular MRI may not be that good. Um, so we really try to fine tune the test for what we're looking for. And we really try to be as knowledgeable as we can before we get the test. Just that was like, an excellent lesson on that because I, I, you know, I want people to understand there's so much more than just walking in exactly what you're saying that there's no one definitive. It's a package. It's a, it's a, uh, it, it's a, it's an umbrella of, of things going on to help diagnose. Dr. Resnick, do orthopedic injuries and ailments present differently in men and women? They can in, in the sense, of, and, and, and this, I, not to mention sexes, if you've had a baby, you experience a certain level of pain that men never get to experience. Yes. Uh -huh. You know, it's an experience by I've itself. I've been there. Right, been right. There. right. Mm -hmm. So so women know, and women will come to me sometimes often much more realistically about surgery. If a man has never had surgery before, mm -hmm. and no offense to the men in the audience, the women will come to the risk of surgery and the pain post op surgery with a little better attitude and understanding of what it's about. Now, sometimes it means they're more scared of it, uh -huh. and sometimes it means they're less scared of it. Uh, but then you have to read the audience, right, and, and kind of talk them through it. Um, and everyone has their own thing. I, I like to tell parents, and th this is maybe some of the members of your audience might find this very interesting, in, in that it's it's kind of a unique thing that I've kind of discovered over the years. That if you have a teenager or a child that comes into surgery and, and boy, again, not to be sexist, somebody, but boys tend to be a little more macho about their injury and they're going to mm -hmm. tough it through. They're going to be fantastic afterwards at a certain age. And women tend to be a little more emotional about it at a certain age. And um, the girls will come in much more emotional when it happens and much better surgically afterwards. And the boys will come in much tougher when it happens and much worse surgically afterwards. And I think it's because the emotional part helps the girls accept it a little sooner that what's really happened because they've played it forward maybe better in some ways. Right. And boys take a little more time to play it forward. And, and I do warn the patients when I see a football player come in who's like super macho, it's going to have an ACL reconstruction, it's going to sit and it's going to be playing football two days later, which is completely irre not realistic. Right. I do warn the parents that when he figures out that he's not playing football next week after the surgery because it hurts and he's got a long way to go, he's going to become very emotional with you. Just be aware and just brace yourself because it's probably going to happen. And I'm probably, again, 80, 90% of the time I'm right about that. And the parents usually thank me for warning them that that can happen, but it does. It does Everyone has to have their own way of accepting the injury and dealing with it. That's such an important point that the emotional component, the um, your attitude towards it going in, 
and your attitude towards pain, you know, which brings me, Dr. Resnick, we are, we're covering a lot more areas than I originally had planned. This is fascinating. Why is there such a gray area with pain management? I know that's a loaded question also. So um, people want to take uh, pain management medications before, during, and after. And uh, my question with that is, how much is the pain medication inhibiting the person from healing? Meaning, I know that it's necessary that literally, if you're debilitated or you can't function, I think pain medication man uh, management is imperative. But um, is it prolonging the person's healing by continuing to dull the pain? So this is, you know, pain is, is a funny partner. Um, if we had no pain, we probably all wouldn't survive to this point because everyone remembers at some point in their life when they touched the hot stove and learned the lesson that burning themselves is very painful. And that forces us to be more cautious around hot stoves and we don't burn ourselves, right? So pain is our body's only mechanism to monitor healing and danger. It really is. So we have pain. It's a noxious stimulus. It's on purpose. Your body has ways of modulating. You have natural opioids in your system and so on. But at the end of the day, when you're recovering from surgery, pain can go one of several ways. And the first way, which is probably most helpful, is someone respects they have pain. It hurts. They stop doing what hurts. They wait for it to get better and they do better. And I always tell people, if you've seen a dog with an injured paw, right? What do they do? They lift the paw and they don't put it down until they're ready. And then right. you'll see the dog, if it's your dog, you'll see the dog put the paw down every once in a while, little yeah. by little, lift it up, put it down. They're testing it. It doesn't hurt. They put it down longer. If it hurts, they pick it up, right? And eventually the dog is running around happy as a clam mm -hmm. with no pain. Mm -hmm. But when do they, the dog just, the dog doesn't ask you for narcotics. The dog mm -hmm. decides when the paw is ready. We're so smart. We're people. We give people opioids. We give them crutches, we put them in a brace, we say, now don't put weight on it. They take the opioids and put weight on it and they screw up the healing, right? So how are we not smarter than dogs? You know, I mean, dogs know what to do. We don't know what to do. We think we're smarter than the dog and we're not. You know, the dog knows what I think. So, so the best part use of pain is what, as a modulator of activity when you're trying to heal because your body knows what hurts and what doesn't hurt. Um, the second part of pain is a little more complicated and there's a lot of data now because you know we have this mega data and AI analyzing everything. And there's this tremendous amount of data that's coming out now that if someone's on a lot of opioids prior to surgery, their demand for opioids after surgery goes up and their inability to get off of opioids after surgery goes down. So we've now come to learn that giving people preoperative opioids makes it less effective post-op for post-op pain. Post-op pain is worse than the pre-op pain, right? And it's more likely for the person to become dependent. So now we are trying to instruct patients more and more. They're like, look, it hurts. Put it up, ice it, get crutches, don't put weight on it. I'm not going to give you opioids pre-op because it's going to give you, I'm going to have a harder time controlling your pain post-op if I give you opioids pre-op. Now, there's certain things like, you know, you, you blow a disc, the pain is terrible. I mean, <laughs> there are certain things that are really terrible. You end up giving people pain medication. But I think we're starting to be much more judicious about what we give, how much we give, and why we give it than we ever used to be. And of course, the opioid crisis brings that all into play. Like, how do we get to where we got? And that's right. a, we could talk a half hour about that in another day. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's a big topic. So, and the last piece of pain, which people don't understand either, is pain is also an equally learned experience. So this is a fascinating thing. There was a point, at some point, there was a clear animal that you could see the brain of the animal. And because you could see the brain, you could do things with the animal still alive. And it's a little tiny mollusk that's very thin and it's clear and whatever. But it did have an earpiece that moved, right? And had a little motor and muscle. And, it, and so if you touch the earpiece with a little pin, the earpiece would wiggle, right? So what they found, they did this experiment a long time ago. They touch the earpiece and it moves. Touch it again lighter, it moves just as much. And if you do it intermittently on different days, the response of the earpiece movement, almost with the lightest touch, will be just as strong. All right. If you look inside the mollusk's brain, inside the brain of the little animal, what you see is the nerve fibers that connect the, the pain sensors to the motor are increasing in size with more and more connections. Uh. So they physically, the pipes and the wires that transmit that pain become bigger and more connected. So the animals learn to anticipate the pain 
And the visceral response is just as great as if the first time you stuck it really hard with the needle. So if you have pain for a very long time and I fix the problem, your body has to undo all those pain wire, wires that have been hypersensitized. And, and narcotics don't do that. It's just time on taking away the stimulus. And they will go back over time. They will settle it's, down Sometimes over time. it goes back perfectly and it's okay. fine. But the longer you have the pain stimulus, the harder it is to get it back. So I see someone who has pain for five years from a problem that they've ignored and they could have had it fixed at year one. It's much harder to get them to be happy because it takes such a long time for that pain stimulus to go away. Now, there's another piece of this is something called reflex dystrophy or causalgia. That's a whole nother thing. And there is this association of, of a syndrome where that pain pathway becomes so self-absorbing, uh, re reinforcing, sorry, wrong word, reinforcing, that the stimulus of surgery amps it up even more. And then the limb becomes so painful they can't use it. And then there's ways to treat that. That's a separate problem. But it's important as a doctor to recognize early on if something like that has happened as opposed to, oh, the patient just has more pain than normal because the medications for that are different than narcotics. It's a different pain. It's a different pathway you're trying to stop. So, so. on this subject, and then we'll go on to some other things, is that so when you say pre-op opioids, is that when you put the person under, you give them the opioids to not feel pain when they wake up? No, no, that's not not at all. The, I'm you're talking about giving it to them. I'm talking about, I know you're going to surgery. Mm. Right. I, right. It's it's like I hurt myself. I can't I can't do what I need to do next week, and I can't do the surgery now for three months. So can you just give me some medication so I can make it through the three months? I got a meeting. I got a wedding. Blah blah blah. And you you're probably not helping those people in in the final now. So when look at the data now that we have much more data, we're probably not helping those people at the end of the day. They're probably better off fixing the problem earlier, doing the normal post-op care, then putting it off for months and months and months and months. Okay. This leads to my next question, yeah. which I had a little personal experience with that I have hip arthritis. It's pretty far gone and no one can answer me when's the right time to have surgery. Uh, yeah, but what the doctors know. always say is when you're ready. So I still, I don't run, I walk, but I do competitive stair climbing, weight training. I do all the very, very fit. Um, why isn't there a black and white answer? Yes, you have degenerative joint disease in your hip and let's get rid, let's fix it now. Why, why isn't there, or you, you do it by your, the time you're 60 or you, why, tell me the guidelines about that. Cause everyone I know is confused about when to go and do it. For, for joint replacements, it's a special question, right? Right. Um, these are quality of life questions for all of these things, right? Joint replacement's not cancer. It's not going to kill you right? It may disable you, but it's not yes. going to kill you. Yes. So you say, okay, it's a quality of life question, right? And every surgery, there's no surgery that's risk-free, right? And they've, they've got it tuned down so nicely, a total hip, maybe there's a half to 1% risk of a complication or problem that really will be an issue and will require additional surgery, additional treatment or antibiotics or other things. And believe me, none of those things are fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you know, 95 to 99% of the time, you don't get that. And also the hips themselves, remember we talked before, this ties into what I was saying, your body is constantly replenishing its bone, replacing the cartilage, repairing itself. A metal hip doesn't do that. A plastic socket doesn't do that, right? So they have a definitive life expectancy in a number of cycles. So you say I do competitive stair, stair climbing and active walking. I'd like to get back to running. And I put a total hip in you. You're Mario Andretti. You're driving 100 miles an hour on the track, you know, 100, 200 miles an hour yes. on the track, <laughs> and you want to know why your tire wore out when yeah. you take the turns, you know, on two wheels instead of four, right? So Mario Andretti wants a new tire, and I got to say to you, it's not going to last as long, right? Right. So, so that's that's on one side of the equation, right? Mario Andretti and the small risks of complications, and some of them are not great, right? Now we got to balance that against quality of life, right? What is your quality of life like? What is it going to be like if I fix it? What can you do now? What you can't do now, right? That inherently is a personal choice. Mm -hmm. Again, back to the personalized medicine in a way, right? It's something we make a decision together. I can't see inside your head what your symptoms are like. You have to help me understand how bad it is for you. So a lot of people say, you'll know when you're ready. Why? Because you'll come in and say, I am miserable. I need this fix now. I am done. I've done everything I can. I put salves on my head. I've eaten spinach. I stopped the gluten. You know, I've done everything possible I can. And this is keeping me up at night. I cannot walk with my daughter. 
I cannot go on vacation. I am done. Yeah, honestly, sometimes that's too long. Right. I was going to say, do we, um, and again, as a longtime marathoner, do we do our 100 marathons and get all 50 states and all seven continents and wear it out to, because this is what people who run now do. The, the level of competition has become insane. I'm sure you know, because this is what you do. And do we get to the point, okay, do I wear it down to nothing and then go get it replaced? Or do I wait till I'm not that far gone? I don't mean me personally. I'm saying in general. My, my perfect my perfect storm is the following. And and it's there's uh, Dale Earnhardt, or, or Hart, what, what's his name? I can't stop. Dale same, Earnhardt, right? yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. Or, or Mary and Trey, any of the driver, any pick any driver you want to pick versus my grandmother driving. Yes, right. Okay? So where is life? Is life like my grandmother when you're 18 years old? Never, right? right. But is life like Mary, Mary and Trady when you're grandma, my grandmother's age? Never. No. Right? So so life really should be lived someplace between my grandmother and Mary and Trady all the time. <laughs> and not, not at either extreme, if you yeah. can. Uh -huh. If you want to be uh -huh. less like my grandmother when you're 90, you'll probably pick a nice medium place where yes. you're not in pain every day when you exercise, Right. And you listen to your body and you find a place that's comfortable. You're happy with the exercise. You get the thrill you want to get, but you're not killing yourself doing it. Right. Right. So I have a patient years and years and years ago who's an avid runner, ran every day, ran marathons, did the whole works, the shooting match. And running was everything to him. And every year he'd have an injury and he'd see me. And I, you know, have the discussion with him and fix whatever problems. And I probably wasn't as smart. This was like 30 years ago, 20 years. I know the guy for a very long time. I probably wasn't as smart as I got older. And, and he came to me one day and he told me the answer. He said, you know, I saw this guy running the other day who was 10 years older than me. And I noticed his stride was a little shorter. His pace was slightly slower than mine. And he looked happy. And I said, I want to be happy when he's his age. So I slowed my pace down a little bit and shortened my stride. And guess what? I haven't had a pain since. See that? Yeah. Right. So, so, so he did the, the, the proper adjustment to make Make like the adjustments better and make longer, it, right? Make it uh -huh. better and longer, right? Yeah. And and uh, that sometimes is advice that's missed, you know, for some people that you know they think if they do it harder they'll feel better, but if it's the joint that's swelling, it's not going to be the case. Muscle soreness, okay, you can buy that, you know. Okay, I'm sorry, I overdid it, but you know, like I said be earlier, if your joints are really hurting or swelling, then then pushing harder doesn't really help you. I know it's not good for you. Now, Dr. Resnick, you served as the team physician for the U.S. Tennis Open and the New Haven Knights professional hockey team. Um, so I see that you have a very thorough section for parents of children and teens in the book, Playing It Safe, Sports mm -hmm. Injuries in Children and Teenagers, which I encourage those of you to listen in and, and, and look into if you have youngsters or kids growing up who are very athletic. Uh, absolutely. Um, but I want to talk about the best medical advances for active adults and seniors. You know, the the um, this explosion of pickleball. Yeah, and, it, you know, just did an article. And oh, I, I, did you? Yeah, I'm not yeah, a um, I'm not a ball sport. I'm not good. You know, I, I like symmetrical as I run, I dance, I weight train. But people who are really adept at, at ball sports that require asymmetrical fitness where they're they're dominating one hand so it's golf or tennis or anything are you seeing a lot of injuries with this advent of pickleball oh yeah the the pick the, the problem for pickleball and and, and it's so interesting because pickleball was invented as this crazy sport right it's right. Mm -hmm. it was pickles ball it was the dog's ball did you know that oh i, did, I don't even know the no, history of it that's yeah, very so interesting pickle, okay. at okay. least i'm told this i don't okay i've heard verified it but i read some articles about it when okay. i was researching the article i just wrote hmm. and so the origin was this pickles ball and they used pickles ball with some paddles and played this game and um anyway so the the upshot is is that the ball was heavy and doesn't bounce very well so it slows the game down so you can play it more leisurely and i ended up having I've played pickleball, but it's not not a sport for me necessarily. I'm more golf. I like to kayak and bike and do other okay. things and paddleboard. I like those better. Um, I did play a lot of tennis when I was younger. So there was, you know, a different kind of sport. But what, what I found, and I have now a lot of patients and friends who play a lot of pickleball, and it's converted to a very competitive, aggressive sport okay. from a more genteel, kind of fun, easy thing to do, like more like sort of halfway between tennis and badminton, if you can think of sports, right? And because the ball is heavy and the ball doesn't bounce very much, if you try to play it like you're playing tennis, which is quite aggressive style, um, there's a lot more stuff that gets hurt. Mm -hmm. 
ball's heavier. The distances are shorter, but the ball's much heavier. So people tend to get more wristy with it. And then they start to get pickleball elbow, which is really tennis elbow anyway. Um, and then all the other assortments of things that people get when they're not, you know, warmed up to play and they haven't been playing a sport and they play it more aggressively than they should. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's become a much more competitive, aggressive game than it was intended. And for the casual player, sometimes they're more prone to injury because of that. Yeah. I just been hearing so much about it as it's like the new over 50 thing to do. Dr. Resnick, I also had, uh, spoke to, um, in my old age, I'm taking yoga now too. And I, I always knew it was good for you. I take yin yoga, which is totally restorative. I don't do the yoga has become a competitive sport now. Who can do more? The hot rooms, the the power yoga, adding weight training in. I think all of this is crazy. The whole point of yoga is to calm your body down, right? My mantra now is not aging gracefully, it's aging peacefully and being at peace and being calm, right? And um, so it's everything, every sport has become insanely competitive. And so, you know, you're walking into a studio just to have an hour away from the house or, you know, uh, burn off some steam and just say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to relax and do a little workout. And it's all become crazy. So uh, are you, are you, um, are you telling patients any particular type of workouts as they get older? I know all exercise is good. I'm the first one to tell you that. Um, but are there some that you're seeing people are having more success with uh, keeping injuries at bay? You know, I, everything has the possibility of going to the extreme. I think these days, I think, I think there was a certain, and like you're explaining it very nicely. I really hadn't heard explained so nicely as the way you've just explained it, but um, certain things have the Zen to it, right? I mean, they're, they're, they are what they are and they're supposed to have a certain attitude and, and calmness about them. And, and yoga was one of those things, but yoga really does tone your body tremendously. And yoga, as you get more and more advanced, my daughter's extremely advanced. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had the, we're on vacation together and um, we're doing a yoga class for fun. Myself, my daughter, a couple of the friends were all together, you know, in this yoga class, making fun of the old guy in right. the room because they're all much, much younger than me. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm much stiffer than they are, uh, you know, for, and, and it's occupational from surgery. You hold still for three hours, you're oh, not sure. looking at muscle and you're doing this microscopic surgery. You're only moving a few millimeters each way and you're watching things at 125 mag everything, your body stiffens, you come out, you try to do yoga right after that. It doesn't happen so fast. But um, so I go on vacation. I say, okay, for relaxation, I'll try a little yoga. And, and um, you know, they say, reach down and grab your ankle. And I reach down and grab halfway between my shin and my, and my knee. And that's about it. So the, the instructors are very different. And, you know, this particular instructor was really good because what she did, she saw my daughter could do a hundred times more than I could in the room. And there were other people who could do half of what I could do and people who could do twice what I could do. Sure. And she would say the pose. And then she would say, if you're not feeling enough, you can go to this. And if you'd like a little extra stretch, you could do that. And if it's too difficult, you can back off to this. And as she talked through the poses, she gave like four choices to everybody in That's, the room. Yeah. And that was lovely. And and right. my even my daughter said to me, she says, you know, she probably saw that, you know, that she could get to a place where few people in the room could really get there. And then she like walked over a few times and said, Oh, you could try this if you want a little extra push to go along. So she managed to make the class fit everyone. Mm -hmm. Now that was mm -hmm. the vacation environment, you know, where the whole idea is everyone there is supposed to have a good time. So I think they must pick instructors who specifically are in tune to that need. But I think a good instructor should be in tune to that need um, for everybody, because really everyone has to find their own level. You know, again, echoing the same theme is like if you're at your own level and comfortable, you know, I'm a golfer and they always say they always say like you should play within your own game. Right. Because you play better with everything. Your own. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's the you know, your own game. I want to drive that point home is that. You know, you do want to stay fit and you do want to stay mobile as you get older, but do it at your own. Like, let's throw the competition out the window and just say, you know, this is as much as I can do. Uh, some of the teachers I have do the same thing. If you could just get to your knees, that's what, you know, meet yourself where you are today. You yeah, know, is what I always great. say. Yeah. Now, um, you're, you're uh, specialized, if you will, in knees and shoulders. And I yes. know it's all connected head, shoulders, knees and toes, as we say. Um, the, the knee, is it? It, it's everything, right? It keeps your body up. It, it's 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 a stabilizer. Um, is the knee that complicated? Is it a complicated joint? 
Yeah, I mean, the knee and shoulder are probably the two most complicated okay. joints in the body, right? If you pick right. two that have the most moving parts that are most complicated, your knee have four main ligaments, you have four, three compartments. There's the two meniscus, which, uh, you know, and all those parts get injured in different ways. And then there's your articular cartilage, which could be injured from a chemical process like gout, or it could be injured from an inflammatory process like psoriatic arthritis has an okay. arthritic component that damages the cartilage very badly. Or it could be, I just got hit by a car and I impacted my kneecap and fractured it, right? So all those things can happen. Um, the kneecap has the extensor mechanism. And what I mean by that is the patella tendon, the kneecap, the patella and the quadriceps muscle. If that's incompetent for any reason, kneecap is broken, the patella tendon is torn or the quad tendon is torn, you can't walk because you have to balance the hamstrings and the quads to propel yourself forward. And if one part is, the quads is a single mechanism four muscles come together. The hamstrings, there's there's multiple tendons. So you could tear a hamstring completely and still ambulate nicely. But if you rupture your quadriceps or fracture your patella, you cannot walk. Right. Or, or if you walk, you have to only walk with your knee perfectly straight. And if you bend it ever so slightly, you can't catch yourself, right? You can only walk with the knee locked out. The funny thing is the only thing that truly locks your knee out in full extension is your kneecap. Right. So if that mechanism is not working, you're in trouble. So the, there's a whole bunch of different things. It's actually, I go over each of those in, in some of the things in the book about all the different components. Right. The shoulder, on the other hand, is the most mobile joint in your body for a special reason in that almost all the other joints, the platform they move against are, are relatively stable. But the shoulder moves against the socket and the socket is on the shoulder blade and the shoulder blade is is not attached to the ribs. It's got muscular connections. So as you raise your people, few people know this. If this was your shoulder blade, let's say, let me do it better this way. This, let's say this is your shoulder blade and the ball and socket is here where my thumb is. If I start to move my arm, the first part will be that. And then the shoulder blade has to move too. Mm -hmm. And we get to 180 degrees of movement where 30% of the movement happens in the shoulder blade. And the other percent is 70% of the movement happens in the ball and socket. So if I have a problem in the ball and socket, like a labral tear instability, the shoulder blade will start moving much more. And we might see what's called scapular winging. My shoulder blade might wing out when I lift my arm, right? And there's a lot of reasons for that. But if someone has an injury and they have trouble throwing and they feel like their shoulder's a little unstable, and I see them and they raise their arm up and their shoulder blade moves first, I know that your shoulder is trying to get the socket under the ball because it can't keep it in place otherwise. Okay. Okay. And it's a little towel, right? So you see mm -hmm. that little extra movement of the shoulder blade, you say, oh, this guy might have a labral tear. You know, going back to physical and history and exam and all this other stuff. So there are little towels that tell you what's really going on. Um, and another example, like ACL might give you instability, but a PCL is a bigger ligament, more important in, in the bigger picture of the thing. It's a much stronger ligament, is ruptured maybe one in a hundred times for every ACL. The PCL doesn't hurt, doesn't give you instability. What it gives you is, is a silent killing of your kneecap. Wow. And it's such a complicated thing because what it is is that the PCL, you know, just looking at the knee here, right? Get the femur and the tibia. In the PCL, that keeps your knee forward, right? So if it's torn, your knee sags back. So you fire your quads, the quads pulls on the kneecap, that pulls your knee back forward. So what happens is the pressure on the kneecap, if you don't have your PCL, goes up dramatically and your kneecap just wears out silently. And people come in with terrible kneecap pain one day. Mm -hmm. And I found out that 20 years ago, they slid into a base before they break away bases in baseball. They slid into the base with their tibia, hit the base first, and they tore their PCL and they never knew it because they didn't have the ACL instability. So there's little things that, you know, just yeah. like together, yeah. these little things that make things more complicated to understand. Um, but there are tells like, you know, okay, I see this. Hmm. Maybe they had a PCL injury a long time ago. Now I start to ask them more questions about other injuries they might have. So you you, you get how the history and the physical can really work together. Absolutely. To Absolutely. I want to ask you some of the ailments that um, I'm hearing people younger and younger getting, and I did suffer from it at one point, is frozen shoulder. What does that mean? So adhesive capsulitis is the technical name for it, which means the lining is getting sticky, if you will. In, in real terms, the lining has a cells called fibroblasts, which are the stuff that makes the, the you know, thick tissue. Also, fibroblasts make scar. Um, for whatever reason, you have a trauma or some other reason that sets off the lining, and the lining decides that, oh, making your shoulder stiffer will be better for you. And it starts to basically contract and get tighter. 
And what happens is as it gets a little tighter, you say, oh, if I move too far, it hurts. Here's, here's actually an interesting thing about pain here. And this, because in this case, pain actually works against you. So it's one of the mm -hmm. few examples where pain works against you a little bit. So as that happens, you say, you stop moving it past that point. Well, the fibroblasts go, oh, a little tighter, right? And so some people start off, they, they can't reach the women more than men. They notice their bra strap, they can't reach right. it so fast. Right. Whereas men, when they stop getting into the back pocket to get their wallet, they have more trouble. So sometimes men will come in sooner than women, uh, later than women will. Women will notice it faster because the first thing you lose is rotating behind your back. The second thing you lose is this kind of rotation. The third thing you lose is elevation because remember your shoulder blade can make up for it. So um, it's any process that causes the lining of the shoulder to tighten. If it tightens enough, you lose range of motion. That becomes a frozen shoulder. And there are different things. We phases. do to treat it. So what's the, what's the treatment for frozen? So early on, early on, anti-inflammatories, steroid, steroid injection therapy, um, all of those things work. Sometimes something to modulate the pain pathways. So they're either a muscle relaxer or, or medication like amitriptyline or gabapentin may help. Um, so you know, early on, those things work. And sometimes that alone is good enough, but sometimes it's a little doggy. You have to do it for a few months. You, you know, give an injection, see improvement. Then it comes to a new plateau. You give another injection. If it really becomes recalcitrant, sometimes we go in arthroscopically and do a release. Okay. Right? All right. But the interesting thing about frozen shoulder is it's more common in women in their 40s to 60. And it's more common in diabetics. And I've had a number of patients present with a frozen shoulder who turned out didn't know they were diabetic. Um, so it's another thing to ask in the history when someone presents with a frozen shoulder, you know, are you starting to feel like you're thirsty more often, peeing more frequently? Uh, do you feel like you're blood sugar, you know, people don't want to say like you're tired, overtired sometimes right. and not overtired. Other times. Your blood sugar is going up and down. You know that you know better than I, you'd probably tell sure. the audience sure. all the things that you would see in a patient who presents with diabetes might be part of the history of someone with a frozen shoulder as well. And they don't know it. So it, it's right. rare that that's happened. It's more often I know they're diabetic and they have a frozen shoulder and those are harder to treat. But I've had it a couple of times over the last 20 or 30 years that where people have come in and Sure enough, I said, you know, let's check your blood sugar. And sure enough, they are diabetic. They didn't know it. Interesting. Wow. Well, you know, Dr. Resnick, this is this is fascinating. I could stay on, on, on here all day with we, you. We, we'll we have, to, have, to, have to have you back for sure. Um, this is all I do I, all day. But I want to hear from you about the role of weight and diet on joints. Does the current uh, popular anti-inflammatory diets work on arthritis and other joint diseases? So uh, that, I think that feeds back a little bit to the gluten question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there's still things we don't really fully understand. Um, you know, there's there's preservatives, there's all kinds of things in, in our diet that were natural, but even the natural products, there are plenty of things that are poisonous in nature and we don't eat them, right? So do we really know, and again, more individual, like can you say that someone from Asia or someone from Africa or someone from Canada or someone from Northern Poland really needs the same diet you know, the American Indian doesn't eat, should, doesn't really need that. That's a classic story, right? They eat, they eat the corn that we sell in the supermarket. It's terrible for them. They need, they need, to, they need to eat the corn that they make for cows because yeah. they need a high fiber corn. They, they know how to digest it. So can, there's no blanket statement about any of these things. You know, there's, there's a thing like glucosamine and chondroitin, which is a common food supplement and it's used for joint pain and you give it to your dog and it seems- Everybody's to giving it to their dogs now, yeah. Mm -hmm. It seems to work perfectly on the dog. So I do believe that there are patients that for whatever reason, that supplement does reduce the inflammatory response in their joints. There are some good studies out of Europe where they compared it to conventional anti-inflammatory where they showed it's pretty good. But I think it's idiosyncratic. And what I mean by that is it really depends on your genetic makeup. So I think there are people who respond to these things and people don't. If you go on a diet that's gluten-free and it makes no difference, it may never make a difference for you. And you probably know in a couple of months. And I think the same thing's true for glucosamine and chondroitin, that if you go on and you feel better, and I tell patients, this is my, my own personal rule of thumb, if you're going to try it, do it for a month, stop for a week. If you're looking for the bottle because pain has returned and you go back on it and it helps you, then you have an idea that it works for you. If you're not looking for the bottle and nothing's changed, it probably doesn't work for you. You probably don't ever use it again, but it probably doesn't make any difference. And um, one of my colleagues suggested this idea of the stopping for a week. Cause I always say, well, is it working for you? And they say, I don't know. I just feel better, but I'm not sure. I did all these other things, but I think the stopping for a week really helps sort that out for people. 
That's they... excellent advice. You know, I spoke to a, um, a, another doctor I had interviewed and we, you know, we were talking about how people try so hard to self-diagnose, self-medicate and self-treat, wait so long to go get things checked. And then when they, by the time they get to you, then you make a recommendation. They say, well, I don't want to do it. You know how much money and time I've spent exploring this? I spent thousands of dollars. Had they just come to you in the first place and said, you know, what do I do about this to save all that money and time? Because the person's already so discouraged by the time they get to you. And, yeah, and I, I think I, that that's, so, you know, I want to encourage people that if something doesn't seem right, go have it looked at and, and have it checked out. Yeah. Yeah. Sadly, I know a lot of stories where they turned out to be a tumor. You know, I yeah. have a section in my book called Sports Tumors. And I don't know if you saw that, but um, I had a child that couldn't wrestle and they they didn't really understand why he couldn't get into the wrestling start position. And it turned out he had a, a benign tumor, but a tumor growing behind his knee and he couldn't bend his knee. And until we removed it, he was never going to be able to wrestle. But he did go to a lot of physical therapy and they thought they could work it out. And it was never going to be worked out. They were just hurting him. Yeah. And yeah. Another patient who had a sarcoma on her shoulder oh. and they thought it was a cyst. And it wasn't a cyst, it was a sarcoma. Um, so there, there are things that, you know, if something's growing and enlarging and it's getting bigger a day and it's not going away, you need to get that Absolutely checked. Absolutely. If it's if it's growing enlarging and painful, you definitely need to get it checked. And don't wait till it's the size of a football, you know. Um, and it's scary because I think, you know, this is um a very smart teacher of mine once said something to me, and I it stuck with me forever. It was in medical school, so this is a long time ago. Um, but he said to me, he says, um, sometimes it's useful to ask someone why they ask the question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like the common response would be, well, why are you so concerned about your thigh pain? You know, I don't see anything in your exam. The x-rays look normal. Why are you insisting on an MRI? And they'll, they'll say to you, oh, my uncle Bud had the same pain 10 years ago and he had a sarcoma and they took his leg off. You know, but if I take them out and show them the x-ray and show there's no tumors, they're fine. Right. Right. They may have a torn cartilage. They don't care. Yeah. That's the best part. They're afraid to come see you for the torn cartilage. They're really worried about what Uncle Bud had. Right. Right. If you don't ask the question, you never know that telling them they, don't, they have a torn cartilage didn't solve their problem because all they wanted to know is they didn't have a tumor. Right. Right. And, so, and again, so, can we can we collectively, you and I, as partner in getting people to not be afraid to go get things checked out? Right. This is a yeah, really I mean, important that is, that is aspect. And, yeah. and um, but it, you know, again, everyone has this other problem today, which they don't have. I think, you know, if you remember the TV show Marcus Welby, I don't know if sure. many people mm -hmm. in the audience remember the the various or House even. I mean, you're yes, the doctor yes. who knows everything, right? And you know, House it's so unrealistic. He diagnoses things. He is. I don't know where he gets the diagnosis from. They're just so far out and they, they pick the most strangest things and the stories aren't always accurate, but they, they sound good for the show. Right. Um, but the, um, the reality is it's very hard these days. The doctors themselves are in tremendous pressure to do things quickly and accurately. And what that does is drives two things. It drives less time face-to-face because -face you're busy documenting everything in the computer, which is a whole yeah. other problem right? Because you spend most of your time at the computer, talking to the computer, you don't talk to your patient, checking boxes that, you know, and, and the other part of it, it drives over testing. Like we talked about that you get a lot more tests because, oh, the patient's complaining. If I miss the tumor in their leg, they're going to sue me, you know, the whole, and I got to check all these boxes. And then the third partner in all this, which people are seeing more and more of is the insurance companies. Right. So the insurance companies have stepped in, in so many ways. And it's, it's, it's good and bad, right? So what is it good for? Well, like I said before, sometimes an early MRI yields a terrible result because you didn't wait long enough and some people get better without that. But if you blanket, make everyone wait six weeks for an MRI, that's probably not good for everyone, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Uh, but at the same time, if everyone got an MRI week one, the system would be bankrupt, right? So we have this constant battle between the insurance companies constantly saying no to us, regardless of the reasons we give, because we haven't checked all the boxes in the computer they want. And our knowledge that we can check that box next week or the week after or six weeks from now, that box will be checked because I know what's wrong with the patient. Right, right. And they're going to end up in surgery anyway. And this is a waste of everyone's time and money. Right. And you're only going to aggravate me and the patient more the patient than me because I've kind of accepted some of it. But at times, it and their livelihood, some people, you're all right, you have to be out of work six weeks and do this, that, and the other thing. Take these medications, I have to do injection. Then you have to do prescribed therapy. And then you might get the MRI. Okay, now we're three months into this. And I knew on day one what was wrong with you. 
And I knew what you needed then, but I can't get approval from your insurance carrier to get paid for it. And not, then not everybody's me, but annoyed. You, yes. But you, they won't pay the hospital. You'll be responsible. You don't want me to do that to you because you'll be calling me up. Why did I got you know what X millions of dollar bill? Not millions, yeah. but you know what I mean. Yeah, it's I know what hospital. you mean. Yeah, it could be, it could be anything from the hospital. Um, and the other piece of that is there's a complete disconnect between the hospital and what they do and the, and the real cost of what things are. And, and we've made that a social problem because the hospital's money was originally used to take care of the indigent. And so everyone paid a hidden tax. But now everyone's saying, I don't want to pay the hidden tax anymore. You got all these other ways to pay for it. And the hospital's built up this giant infrastructure around the hidden tax that we somehow can't get rid of. Right. So it, 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 I, I don't know how we fix the that part of it. It's, it's very complicated. Dr. Resnick, this has been fascinating. And of course, I'm going to have you back. And uh, next, we'll tackle the hips. Yeah, we'll, t- yeah, we'll tackle sure. the hips feet. Uh, but before I let you go, could you tell me what you like about getting older? What I like about getting older? Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of cool things. I mean, first of all, being able to do this. I mean, I, I've I've written a lot of booklets for my patients. I write a lot of 60, 70 articles published, and I've done a lot of different things o- over the years. But to have the perspective to pull it all together and put it into place in one resource, that is, it turned out to be a ton of fun for me and really exciting. And right now the book is being launched and I'm getting a lot of pre-sales over the internet. And it, it I am today, you're hitting me on a high today, you know, like right. it, it just, it's just fun to see the response I'm getting for stuff that I know. And it's great. And that's fun. Second piece of it, it's is um, I'm very um, I was an engineer first, and I've done volunteer missions and been all over the world doing some interesting, and that's kind of fun. But because I was an engineer, I'm very interested in AI, and I've written a bunch of articles on how medicine impacts AI, and I've written a lot about ethics in AI. Mm-hmm. Um, and AI medicine is a topic we could do a show on as well because it, that's going to become more and more every day. Um, and that is very exciting and very fun for me in the sense that it it just puts together a lot of my prior computer knowledge and computer programming and being an engineer and then all my medical knowledge and the practical aspects of what I've learned with patients. And to see how dicey that's going to be and how much we can affect it um, is going to be really interesting. And, and I want to say it's fun. I think I, I'm looking to the challenge to be part of that. That's well. fantastic. Fantastic. Dr. Alan Resnick, orthopedic surgeon based in Connecticut, and he's the author of Knee and Shoulder Handbook, The Keys to a Pain-Free Active Life. And for more information about Dr. Resnick and his book, you can go to www.drresnick.com, which is D-R-R-E-Z-N-I-K, resnick.com. And thank you all for listening to my show. And please subscribe here at Patricia Greenberg for more engaging discussions about all things aging well. Thank you again, Dr. Resnick, and we hope to see you again soon. Okay.